Peace, family. Y'all know who it is. It's Bakari Lumumba, back once again, the progenitor of LumumbaSpeaks.com, a black empowerment initiative where we believe we could gain a competitive advantage by always betting on black. Before we get started, you know we got to pay the cost to be the boss. And what does that mean? That means we're running the HBO special. That means help a brother out. Want to make sure that you hit the subscribe and the like button, as well as the notification bell. We have a lot of people ghost watching our videos. We appreciate you watching. We love the fact that we're getting hours and viewership, but we want to make sure that you what? Hit the subscribe button. We want to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of summer. So I'm back once again with another video where I'm taking time to examine, not only do we want to honor, but we want to examine the legacy of one William Felton Russell, also known as Bill Russell. As many of you may be aware, he passed away yesterday. And so this is a video where we want to make sure that we honor our moral obligation to remember, but as well as invoking the wisdom of our late great queen mother ancestor, Fannie Lou Hamer, who taught us Never forget where you come from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. And so any, for anyone out there who was a basketball historian, basketball aficionado, you would know that um, Bill Russell was the first black superstar in the NBA. Of course, you could juxtapose that along with what um, one um, Will Chamberlain, but we're going to be touching on, of course, the late great um, Bill Russell. So just breaking this down a little bit, of course, he was born in the Deep South, born February 12th, 1934, in Monroe, Louisiana, experienced um, dogged racism, Jim Crowism at an early age. His family had to actually move into a public housing project to escape the, um, the vitriolic and violent um, form of racism that, of course, his family was facing at that time. Uh, grew up in, from humble beginnings, became a, a, actually many would argue a world-class athlete. Many people felt that he could have even been an Olympic high jumper, not just a basketball player, right? Sitting at six foot ten inches tall, he was known for his basketball, for his defensive prowess, of course his rebounding, and his ability to play, what, not only team defense, but of course one-on-one -on -one man to man defense right and so he became a superstar even though he wasn't a great uh, offensive player considered the greatest winner in uh, american professional sports 11 championships uh he was even the first black head coach uh in the nba and he was actually a player coach and during those years as player coach they actually won two uh, NBA World Championship, so he has 11 in total, but we're going to get a bit into that. But just want to give a brief biography of him, and then we're going to get into some of his off-the-field exploits, because even though he was a great athlete, he was known for being more than an athlete, and it was really what he did off the court that led many people to so hold him in such high esteem. So, of course, we know in college he was a two-time uh, NCAA champion playing for the San Francisco Dons, right? Many people may be unaware that actually he was so dominant that they changed the rules, right? And widened the lane. Many people think of them changing the rules when Lou Alcindor, and now known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, played for UCLA when they uh, outlawed dunking of the basketball because, I mean, he would just put them work like that. It was nothing that they could do. But they actually changed the rules, not just for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in, in the 60s at UCLA, but even in the 50s with Bill Russell when he led them to two national championships and unprecedented precedent at the time, 55-game win streak. Um, one of the things that people need to know is, of course, he was drafted to the Boston, Boston Celtics, and his rookie contract was $24,000. Uh, this was a, the equivalent by many estimates to be about a little bit over a quarter million dollars in today's money. But the issue was that the amount of money he made allowed him not to have to work a part-time job in the offseason to maintain his livelihood. And so for many of you who are aware, Boston has been known as one of the most racist, uh, northernmost cities, of course, in the United States. Um, and, but, but he was playing, ironically, for a very progressive franchise, right? And so... Russ would always state that he plays for the Celtics, not for the city of Boston, right? So we know that uh, Red Arbach, the famous Red, Red Arbach back then, the famous legendary coach, had a no-color clause, right? He, he didn't care what color you were. If you could play, you could play. Uh, cause we know, uh, unfortunately, African-American players were barred from pro professional basketball, as they were in many other sports, most notably baseball. Um, with that being said, uh, 
he was even under FBI surveillance, right, for being called an uppity Negro and being mean to white. They say he was mean to white children, so the FBI was actually surveilling him, had had a foul on him because he was an uppity Negro because he carried himself in such high esteem, had self-confidence, and wasn't willing to, you know, kowtow to uh, the um, right, white races of the day. Uh, secondly, uh, during the Celtics' legendary run of a string of championships in the 60s, he actually had, uh, he lived in a suburb of Boston that was north of Boston, actually had white vandals break into his home, a spray paint racist graffiti on the walls, damage his trophies, and even defecate in all of the bedroom, all of the beds in his home. This is the level of racism that he was fighting against, right? So we're talking about a man who overcame um, extremely difficult odds, right, to become one of the greatest that ever lived. Um, but also, he even stood with um, Muhammad Ali when they had the Cleveland Summit in 1967, where Muhammad Ali stated that I would not go 3,000 some miles to fight against the Viet Cong. When Muhammad Ali said that you are my enemy, you are my oppressor when I want justice, you are my oppressor when I want freedom. No Viet Cong has ever called me nigger, right? Uh, Bill Russell stood with him, and when Muhammad, and when the Reverend Doctor um, Martin Luther King Jr gave his iconic I Have a Dream speech. And we know we got to have a whole conversation about the I Have a Dream speech, particularly what Malcolm X talked about, how the um, the uh, integrating of the March on Washington, how it cooled it down, right? Um, however, Dr. King wanted Bill Russell to stand with him when he gave the speech. And Bill Russell, not willing to be someone who was just seeking fame, Say that I haven't, I can't stand with you because I have not done enough. So many people advocated for him. He even is known as stating that he he hated, he distrusted or hated white people because they were people, but he loved black people because they were black, right? But many people felt that he lived a life of contradiction, right? That he was a bit hypocritical. You're advocating for black power. You're standing with Muhammad Ali. You you, you he, he even went by a, a um, nickname that was representative of him being a member of the Nation of Islam. But at the same time, he married white women throughout his life, right? So many people took issue and ambush with the fact that he's straddling the fence, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth, he's trying to what? Walk uh, on both sides of the street, right? Um, however, with that being said, what we do know is he was someone who was truly, truly um, an advocate and a fighter and a promoter of what African Americans gaining what equal protection under the law, right? I don't believe that he uh, identified himself per se as someone who was a black nationalist or pan-Africanist or someone who actually was a member of that black radical tradition of audacious self-assertion in the face of white hegemony. However, what I do believe he was like many black people, ideologically uh, ambiguous, right? And as a result, he simply chose to what, engage in actions that he believed would help black people, even though he didn't have a, a true ideological, ideological base. So I think that's the way I would surmise his political and activist activity. And then last but not least, um, this is a man who at the age of, I believe, 83, went on his seldom used Twitter account and posted a picture of him kneeling in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick. Now, as we all know, I think for me, this is rather revolutionary, right? This is rather audacious because as we know, most people, irrespective of the social economic status, racial ethnic back, uh, identity or background, or even political ideological frame of reference, tend to what? Become more conservative as they get older. So for him to stand in solidarity with Kaepernick and come out and publicly speak in light in favor of him, I think is something to be admired. So I just wanted to take some time to kind of review and interrogate his life, right? We know he was a great champion. He won a gold medal, I believe, at the 56 Olympics um, against the Russians, uh, where they blew them out. After, of course, winning two national titles, jumping into, into the league and, and winning that string of 11 titles in 13 years, becoming the first black head coach. He was even asked at this introductory press conference when he became the first black head coach. They asked him, are you going to be racist towards white players, right? So these are the type of issues he had to deal with. And he was the first. He was the standard bearer uh, of black head coaches in the NBA. And, of course, he was successful, but he won two titles with the Boston Celtics. Went on later to coach the Seattle Supersonics. 
didn't win the championship, but did lead them to having some winning seasons and making the playoffs. So I just want to take time out to honor and also interrogate one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived, one William Felton Russell. You all know what to do. Until next time, hit the subscribe and like button. Make sure you hit the notification bell so you can be informed of when our next video post. Y'all know what to do. Always bet on black. Peace.